so sure was real. What if you were unable to wake from that dream? How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? What is happening to me? Hello, this is Hiroshi Shibe with another episode of Satoshi's Treasure Hunter. And on this episode, we're going to talk about the book Burning Crow, which was the object that you had to give to Field Agent 2 in order to receive his key. Um, from the intro, you saw the Matrix trailer, which was uh, just celebrated its 20th anniversary, and it seems that Cyberpunk has reach I won't say it's apex but it's coming into its own you you know you have your classic Keanu Reeves there in the Matrix who was also in Johnny Neonic uh we'll talk a little bit more towards the end here in this intro for this episode for this review but you have you know Keanu Reeves you've had you know almost human on Fox you have Alter Carbon you've had a surgeons in cyberpunk games like Cypher and 2064 you have another great game uh, which we'll talk about at the end here with cyberpunkdom uh, coming into his own and the reason why we're talking about this is because cyberpunk you know has had an influence on this big game particularly the fact that it comes from the adventure text games you have you know blade runner had its sequel You've had, you know, Ghost in the Shell, which we won't talk about. You have the visual aesthetics, you know, really emphasized in a lot of fan art and Tumblr and things of that nature. But cyberpunk seems to be coming slowly into reality as corporations seem to transcend or transplant, in many cases, nation states. And I thought that it was very important to kind of, you know, visually show some of the cyberpunk games and television shows that have been here. Um, I'll have a list in the show notes to what I'm showing you um, for your perusal as well as some uh, books you can read. Uh, but in particular, you know, you have Cyberpunk 2077, which is probably the most anticipated game out there in the market. Um, particularly for myself, is a game that I want to get. I, I, I know you're not supposed to pre-order games, but... Goddamn, I, I almost want to throw down 250 to get that special edition PC. I know it's on Windows and not Linux uh, edition of the Cyberpunk 2077. And now that it, we know that we have uh, Keanu Reeves playing a, a central character from the RPG game Mike, Mr. Silverhands himself, uh, in, the, in the game, I, I kind of oh, want to throw down some money, if you will. But... Let's get into this. Let's talk about this book, Burning Chrome, what it is, what the story Burning Chrome is, and what we can maybe glean from the book itself if we can, if you will, as far as maybe potential clues or future hints of what is to come for the Satoshi Treasure Hunters, uh, or Satoshi Treasure Hunt game. So Hunters, let's, let's get into it. So here we are with the book, Burning Chrome. So, Burning Chrome is uh, a short story that was published by William Gibson in 1982 through the magazine AMI. Now, AMI is one of those magazines, like you would say, like sci-fi tech uh, books. Uh, magazines were the thing back in the you know 70s and 80s, and so much like you would say, like a Tumblr page, but or a blog posts or some of these fan sites. Uh, this this was the medium where short stories were published and because they were magazines and had to sell out advertisement a lot of stories got published through the decades before I guess you can say magazines gave the way to digital uh, Burning Chrome is considered one of the first stories that take place in William Gibson's uh, Sprawl trilogy uh, Johnny Minomic's characters uh, come from um, the Johnny Monarch story and do take place in the sprawl, particularly Molly, and then we find out the fate of Johnny Monarch himself, uh, which is also a short story that appears here in Burning Chrome. It's a collection of all of William Gibson's short stories, the book itself. Uh, you know, uh, 
This bra itself, I guess we will cover. It has a uh, Necromancer, what is it? Necromancer, Count Zero, Mona Lisa. Necromancer uh, was published in the year 84. Uh, Count Zero, 86. Mona, Mona uh, Lisa was 88. This collection of his short stories, which is a cache of different types of sci-fi stories. Some of them are, you can say, proto-cyberpunk. -cyber Some are just, you know, straight up sci-fi stories. Are... Um, took place be pri written prior to the year 86 um, so they're trying to cash in on the the success of Necro uh, the Necromancer story um, you know they they collected these short stories and called it Burning Chrome it was interesting the type of collections that they, they put together I guess the key phrase Chrome was used in almost every single story so I don't know that that was the reason why they were put together because there's no real serious like theme or or interconnecting yeah like an intergalactic or interconnecting theme in any of these short stories beyond just you know dystopia and some of the uh, sci-fi you know imagery and aesthetics if you will of the short stories themselves um, some are pretty long some are pretty really short um, a few you kind of wish you had more or I would say more like a couple where you wish you had more could have been turned into a novel of sorts but they do what they do um, <clears throat> so the collection of stories in Burning Chrome are uh, Johnny Mnemonic uh, which is the first story Green Search Continuum uh, Fragments of a Hologram The Belonging Kind which was co-written with John Shirley and we'll talk about that in a second uh, Hinterlands, Red Star, Winter Orbit New Rose Hotel, The Winter Hotel, and Burning Chrome, which is the last story and the name of the collection. Uh, all these books, like I said, were published between basically 81 till uh, 86 when the collection was made. Uh, a couple of these stories were turned into movies. Uh, Johnny Minomic is the one pretty much everyone knows, which it has Keanu Reeves in it. Uh, not the best movie, you say, but... Uh, it was at the height, I guess you could say, of the 90s or early 90s where some of these, was it late 90s, 94, I guess, or some of these cyberpunk movies were being made, you know, the first of which was um, Blade Runner, which had the sequel, Blade Runner 2049, a couple years ago. Uh, you also had, like, uh, Stranger Days. Um, hackers, I guess you could say, cyberpunk, um, Tank Girl, like there was a bunch of films that came out at the time uh, when Johnny Minot came out, so you can understand when the film was made. It's not exactly the most well done film, and if there was a remake to be made, that could be a remake, if you will. Oh, imagine Keanu Reeves playing the villain in that in that film. That would be dope. But. Um, yeah, that was made into a movie. Greenbacks Continuum, had, there's a short British BBC uh, of that particular story. And then News Road Hotel, which had like Christopher Walken and William Defoe, and it's, it's kind of garbage. Uh, William Gibson hasn't had the best run of luck when it comes to adaptions of his works. Um, Philip K. Dick, I can say, you can say, has had a better run, if you will. But William Gibson, for whatever reason, hasn't had the best of luck. Video game-wise, he's had better luck. Uh, he has uh, The Sprawl is a, a tabletop or, or, or role-playing game. Um, Johnny Minoc, I believe, was made into a uh, video game. And his games, those games seem, were, seem to be, you know, um, do pretty well. So... Let's get, you know, oh, there's a couple things. Uh, Burning Chrome is the first time that the term cyberspace, which is widely used now, was coined. The term Matrix, which obviously, you know, William Gibson and, um, you know, Philip K. Uh, and pretty much anime in general heavily influenced that movie. So the term Matrix comes from William Gibson himself, or at least he coined that term as far as the cyberpunk um, or technology or sci-fi realm it goes you know he was responsible for that term getting out there um, and that comes from the burning chrome itself and the concept of you know virtual worlds or virtual reality or the concept of jacking in which you see in the the uh, Johnny Monomic film as well as the short story you know that concept is really heavily developed by William Gibson himself um, which you know clearly the matrix you know kind of ripped off or, or took that concept and took it to a different level. 
So let's get into the, the stories themselves. Oh, before we get into the stories. So John Shirley was a co-writer of one of the short stories. And the art tour, the first art tour, is called the Shirley Tour. And the artist's name is Shirley. I don't know if that's actually the artist's real name. I don't know if that's going to be a hint or a clue on how to obtain the key. But I found it very interesting that this collection of short stories, uh, one of the books was co-authored by John Shirley and it has to deal with art. So maybe we need to really heavily look into that particular short story. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit when we get into it. Um, all right, so let's talk about these short stories. So the first of these short stories is Johnny Mnemonic. Um, it's a noir kind of chase film. Uh, the main character, Johnny Mnemonic, is this guy that has basically hard drive wired into his brain so that he can... Um, contain the information in his brain and it's not connected to the web. At this point in the, the universe that uh, William Gibson has created, uh, information just like now uh, is constantly hacked. So if you want to keep something private, you don't keep it online, but you need to keep it contained and accessible. So people have these hard drives built into their brains and they travel to different places and contain that knowledge in a certain set of, uh, in the short story, uh, a mononic phrase is given and it unlocks like a passphrase if you will and it unencrypts the hard drive and the information is dumped and what it is is information is uh, critical to the Yakuza who are running theme in a lot of um, basically Will Gimson's stories you know you have the corporations that are basically functioning as uh, nation states uh, the mobs um, criminal organizations run rampant if you will and the Yakuza is a very powerful uh, organization so basically Johnny Minarlik this character has this information in his brain he's trying to acquire enough money to basically get this hard drive this the apparatus that he has in his brain ripped out and his memories restored because in order to contain the, the information he had to give up a lot of his memories a lot of his childhood memories and he basically wants out of the game and He's caught between two organizations, the, the, the man who hired him, who ripped off the Yakuza, the Yakuza, and a hidden organization, a kind of like a, a rebellious group that wants the information that Johnny has in his head and freely distributed um, to the world. And so it's this noir chase. Johnny is not a, really a hero. You have this character, Molly, that plays his bodyguard slash kind of kidnapper who takes him to... Um, to the rebels and incense and into really which was also in the movie which i thought was kind of hilarious uh a dolphin that was like this sideshow and wasn't part of a navy project a project like the uh, movie that has all these uh computer components embedded into his brain and he's like highly intelligent dolphins are highly intelligent but more so if you will in this book that's able to extract his information without killing johnny and then um, broadcasting it to to the world, basically. And that's pretty much the story in itself. It's just the, you know, Johnny running from the Yakuza, trying to evade them, trying to get away from assassins, uh, getting this information uh, extracted from his head and having his uh, memories restored, which, which, do, which do happen for him. Him and the character Molly end up bonding and they eventually end up working for the dolphin and um, taking the memories that Johnny has had from past uh, jobs that he's done and using that to build an empire, if you will, of their own. Uh, it's interesting how the, 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 the dystopia that they talk about, the different tiers of the systems that's being built within, which will eventually become the sprawl, is uh, on display here, the world that, uh, that Johnny lives in and how people are very desperate and very people are very pressed in this world and there's basically very little to no rights technology is so omnipresent that it's, it's almost an oppressive tool in and of itself just by its very existence uh the second story um deals with um greenbacks and continuums it's like this art deco sci-fi story in which a photographer is hired to take these Art Deco 
pictures and as he's doing so he sees these futuristic people and he thinks he's hallucinating he thinks they might be aliens he talks to this alien chaser and this alien chaser saying no you're just seeing images of the subconscious and he explains how you know ufos went from one thing to another depending on what's in the media that's what people see and that's what he's seeing it's just so these conscious this subconscious awakening of what uh, all the people are, are are seeing when he uh, takes these pictures and as he continues on his journey and taking these art deco pictures he, he feels like he's going a little bit more crazier each time uh, he has not as say a conversation with these futuristic people but uh, as he's traveling and taking more pictures and hears these conversations, he gets more descriptive about them. Like they're all white. They look like the Aryan, you know, white people, blonde hair. Uh, they have like these kind of avocado shaped cars and it, he sees them everywhere, everywhere he goes. He started out in the desert and slowly he's creeped into LA. No matter where he goes and takes his pictures, he sees these people. Uh, he eventually turns his photographs into the into uh, his publisher they love them he doesn't really know what to do with this information he just knows that whatever he's seen it's potentially real real and whatever future might be happening where this like this bland as he f explains this is very corporatized very blah people um that may be coming or will end up becoming um are going to exist it's not a world he wants to particularly live in and that's pretty much the story in of itself um, there's really not too much to it uh, fragments of a hologram rose is about um, this dystopian world where this this indentured servitude is a thing where you indentured your parents were indentured to you or you indentured yourself to corporations you work for free basically and they take care of you for a period of time and that process allows you to eventually become a member of that organization at the end of your your servitude uh, but this particular person uh, leaves like like a day before he is servitude was going to get up uh, he goes to the coast apparently the coast of the the coast in particular they talk about the west coast but the coast have rebelled against the rest of the nation and there's warfare he was in san francisco and it's like this dystopian world where all these different warring fractions are trying to con control San Francisco. He doesn't really talk about him participating in the fight, but he's just personally there. He eventually falls down towards towards the borderland between Mexico and the United States and lives in a world where of shanty shacks and a refugee status, if you will, and trying to garner enough money to, to live a better existence. And the the tech is really like this um, VR type system where you can not necessarily jack in, but you kind of have like the device to see this different world. And it's just the experience of this loneliness of this person living into this um, dystopian existence, if you will, and trying to get by. Um, the interesting thing about this, I, I thought, was like, you know, he's in Texas, near Texas and stuff. And I guess Texas was the big winner of these coastal wars. And I, I felt that was very strange. I know a lot of dystopian novels have like Texas, the Great Republic of Texas or the, the South or something like that winning. And I thought about it for a while. I was like, it really, even today's sense or even back in the 80s when this was made, wouldn't really make sense considering the resources that the coast have. The fact there's more military bases in the West Coast, uh, more industry, the ability to technology and uh, the ability of resources of people, the knowledge base. It wouldn't really make sense that the coast would lose and Texas would win, but for this particular story, it did. It was fairly short. It was okay. Um, it's not my favorite story because really there wasn't much to it. Okay. Um, the Belonging Kind is the the one that's uh, co-written by John Shirley. Um, it's a very strange one because it's kind of more of a classic sci-fi story, not really so much so cyberpunk or even the story is The Belonging Kind. I really didn't like this particular one. It's co-written by John Shirley that has the same name as uh, the art tour uh, person. Last name I should say. Um, it's basically about a man who discovers a new set of people that are living among us. He goes to all these different types of bars and he realizes that there's a woman and it's very similar to um, 
what is that film? Um, I think it's called like Skin Something or New Skin with um, she plays Black Widow, Scarlett Johansson, where she's an alien and lures men from different places and ends up eating them or feeding them to her people. Um, that doesn't quite happen here, but this is this man, lonely man, that goes to all these different bars and he realizes that there's this woman that kind of like distracts people while this other man like robs them, um, these different bar people. And they they don't really exist, but somehow he sees them and he ends up becoming one of them. And it's, it's really bizarre. I guess you could say it's kind of like almost like a body horror story. Um, don't know what to make of it. It was... It was interesting, um, but there wasn't enough there for me to really grapple with or even really to enjoy the story. I just thought it was interesting about the concept of human existence and what humans look like. That's something that's really heavily emphasized in the story. And I thought that might be a bit of a hint towards the art tour, considering the images that have been shared on the, the Shirley tour site have to do with humans and what they look like and the disembodiment of the human face and the human existence um the appearance if you will might be a hint from there might be something there in the short story that might help as far as a clue goes towards that or it could be just me grappling straws uh, straws and who knows um it's one of those keys is out there that nobody this thus far has solved yet lots of notes here um, oh, the Hitterlands. The Hitterlands I found very fascinating. It has to deal with a, a world in which the USR kind of won the space race, in a sense. Um, there is a there is a wormhole-ish type of a deal near Saturn, in which or Mars, I should say, in which uh, astronauts or cosmonauts disappear. And they come back a couple years later and they're basically can canatonic. But they have, uh, the first person that came back had a, like a seashell that is clearly like alien. And then the next person that came back had like a cure for cancer. And so you have a race of people that line up and want to go into this wormhole to, to obtain this future knowledge that will benefit humanity. And it's about this guy that basically, and this woman that basically, um, live on the space station near this wormhole and wait for the return of the various astronauts, the cosmonauts that come back through that wormhole and try to uh, transition them back um, into existence. Most of the astronauts and cosmonauts that come back um, either are, are dying or will die soon afterwards. Very few of them have actually ever lived. Not only that, but not everyone that goes through the wormhole and comes back actually has this future knowledge or even goes through the wormhole and gets picked to go through. And so he's one of those people who try to go through but wasn't picked. And so he's on this station with this other woman and they try to um, help the volunteers, help them um, transition back into um, some kind of state of existence, if you will. And it's about basically all these people lining up to volunteer to have this done to them and somehow, in essence, be a hero to mankind with this future knowledge. It's a very interesting story, what people will do to um, seek power in a sense, but not actually really fundamentally obtain power. So it was a bit of a meditation on that, if you will, with that story. Uh, Red Star Winter Orbit is another, you know, it has to deal with um, the fact that the Cold War is still going on when William Gibson is writing the story. So again, it's another USSR story, another Russian story. It's about a Russian space station that is in orbit, but it's, you know, it's old, it's kind of decaying, the Russians don't have the money to repair it, so they're going to cause it to go into a decaying orbit. And this is one particular astronaut that's been up there for 20 years and he can't go back to the Earth. Because I guess you could say, in essence, it going back to Earth will kill him, the gravity, if you will. He's been into space too long. And so the USSR, he's considered a hero, but the USSR doesn't want him to come back. And they don't want people to know exactly why the, the station is tanking. They don't want people to know that they failed, in essence, to be able to maintain the station. So they have their military people. There's the scientists on one side and the military people on the other side. So they're going to have the military people sabotage the station, cause it to go decay, and, you know, it was an accident and people died, and they were going to blame this astronaut. Well, he figures it out, 
he rebels he gets his fellow um cosmonauts off off the planet um because or not off the planet but off the station and down towards heading towards china and then from china they can go to japan and declare you know refugee status or uh seek uh, you know defect if you will um and so he he goes through the process of doing that one of his fellow restaurant astronauts turns around and sabotages the military side so they don't get to him and his space station just basically begins to really do the decay that the Russians wanted to, the USR government wanted to do in the first place and what ends up happening is um, he gets picked up by these um, Americans who are on these um, I guess you can say like the Google style balloons but instead of satellites there's people on there living there like those hot air balloons but I imagine them being like big structures and they um, intercept him and they're going to take over the, his particular station and they ask for a tour because they think this will be you know a, once they fix everything like refix the ability of the the station's orbit to where it can be somewhat in the atmosphere not fully out in space but in the atmosphere that is currently at and stabilize it they can live there and live in that existence and i guess in this particular story you know, the USR is one and America is like this decaying place. And that's why these people are up in, in, in the air, living their life with their, you know, their families and their children and stuff, um, living in a free space. Um, okay, the News wrote, Hotel kind of goes back to kind of the kind of cyberpunkish um, film, the, you know, kind of noir story about uh, a robbery that's gone wrong. These guys were criminals. They got betrayed. Uh, the corporation takes them out. They work for a corporation. Their job is to basically extract people, kidnap them. So for example, say, say for example, Bill Gates, right? He's the head of the company, correct? Of uh, Microsoft. But say for example, uh, Bill Gates wasn't like the head of Microsoft, but he works for a corporation like IBM, right? There was no Microsoft, and he's a prominent computer thinker. Well, these guys would go, and they would try to extract, you know, kidnap uh, Bill Gates, and he would then work for the company of Cisco. They would kidnap him, and that's the thing to do where, you know, you have to hide your scientists, hide your intellectual property, hide the people and the product behind all these different security walls, and it's about this next level of corporate espionage where they use, you know, spy military tactics to get these people. These guys get betrayed. Um, they're also dying. They try to give the thumb, you know, the F.U. to the corporation that betrayed them. And it's just their experience of being in this hotel and how things just went wrong for them. It was an okay story. Um, I can kind of see, you know... Like, even now, today, you know, corporate espionage is a thing. When's, well, you know, depending on if you go through conspiracy boards, I wouldn't say people are getting kidnapped. But definitely, you know, you see the stories, particularly when it comes to nation states, you know, particularly China. The thing I got from that particular story was, like, how the corporations um, are using these espionage tactics, which you can see going on now with the nation states, you know, like China and the U.S., where... They have people that go into various corporations and either backdoor stuff or secretly, like, for example, Spectrum. People think Spectrum was a backdoor deliberately done um, by the United States, whether it was with the corporation, with the corporation, cooperation of Intel or not, um, was done, like an espionage level. Uh, China is known to go and extract um, information from both corporations and military companies to be able to do things from subs to um, their internet infrastructure to different stuff like that um, so something that goes on now not necessarily you know taking people but definitely taking ip or technology or information and bringing it back to to their country or to a particular uh, corporation and being able to duplicate it replicate it make their their own so some future thinking there on the part of winter, winter market um very much about the concept of taking your um, your body, if you will, your mind, and putting it on the internet. Um, the concept of fame um, has to do with a woman named Lisa who 
uh, has this very degenerate um, disease and so she jacks into the system and has this completely very outgoing personality and does uh, this very Hollywood stuff and it's about her editor who edits her image. So think of it like YouTube or uh, social media now and curates this very specific image that's projected out into the world and makes money for people. She does films in this case. And um, the concept of leaving one's body behind and becoming this digital person and seeking to be a digital person permanently. Um, I would say Black Mirror, Black Mirror's Sanjito took this concept to a completely different level. If you've ever seen that, that's one of my favorite episodes when it comes to sci-fi sci -fi channel, uh, sci-fi um, television and Pretty much, I think everyone I talk to whose favorite Black Mirror episode is the San, San Gito one that deals with the concept of leaving your body behind and living in a virtual world full time. So that's another William Gibson concept that people have taken and, and done things with. Then the next story... Um, Winter Hotel, I like this story. It's about this kid that, um, these two kids um, that are eventually become together, boyfriend and girlfriend. Toxic, it does toxic relationships and drug addiction. And they live in a world where you have these cyber locks, these things that prevent you from doing stuff. So the, the, the female in the story has a chastity lock that prevents her from engaging in sexual in intercourse. So it's very dystopian where these females, because the men don't have it, but she has it to prevent her from engaging in, in sexual interaction. And um, she can't be physically touched. It causes her to have violent spasms and things of that nature. And she wants to like basically leave her current existence and like fuck her parents and fuck the world and just go. And she's trying to build money um, by being a, um, a cyber person, a hacker, if you will. And she uses the fact that her mind has been rewired to enable her to do that. Uh, her boyfriend, um, the main character, he ends up becoming like a, this dog fighter where you control these basically model planes and you have these dog fights. Think of um, drone uh, drones and slash battle bots that was a big thing and you're fighting an arena and he ends up getting um, very good at it but he's very toxic I, he's able to make this money he portrays a lot of people in doing so including his girlfriend by getting this particular drug that enables him to be a better better fighter you see this in the uh, the gaming world currently where people take like Adderall or different types of drugs to allow them to be up and be more focused and that's why gamers are getting drug tested <laughs> and stuff so the whole concept of entertainment of you know a gamer a person uh, playing a machine if you will and entertaining people is it explored in this particular short story and this, the, what the nature of doing that does to you as a person and the, the, the concept of fame and the concept of being liked or loved and trying to be somewhere else, if you will, trying to obtain a different status, uh, the nature of relationships and how far you would go. This guy was a complete trash person. And so it, it was a very interesting story. It's a very interesting story of how a lot of what William Gibson plays with in this particular story is something that we see currently played out um, in the world now with the nature of people and toxicity and um, relationships and fame and seeking to be a better player and just you know how one can go about that and just fuck everybody down fuck everyone around them in order to obtain that kind of status and then we get to the final story final short story which is the title of the book which is called burning chrome so Burning Chrome takes place in the Sprawl universe. Um, the Sprawl is this mega mega city, you know, a la Dread, if you will. It's like it's like the west east coast cities of um, Boston, New York. What's the other city that it's? There's another city that's uh, Philadelphia, 
and they're all like smashed together, if you will. And yeah, it's, no, it's Boston, Atlanta. Atlanta is the sprawl. And they're all like smashed together into this one big existence. And it's about these two guys, these hackers, and they are attempting to steal money from this big time criminal, which could easily cause them to obtain death. Um, if they get caught and they're trying to get into this person's vault, this person's money source. They are the, uh, this person is called Burning Chrome and she uh, is a, the money launderer for the mafia. So if these guys get caught, they're dead. And one of them's doing it for a girl. The other one is doing it, you know, um, also for the girl. They're both in love with the same girl. Um, one of the guys is, um, he's basically like, He's 28 years old, so he's considered old in the the console console game, as William Gibson calls it, this ability to jack into the internet, into the system, if you will. Um, what I found interesting is that they in the, the book um, he describes the ability to hijack phone lines because phone lines is still a thing, if you will, in this universe. So it's not, you know, fiber optics, it's not anything like that. It's jacking into phone lines. There's no Wi-Fi, if you will. And they have these, like, kind of virtual um, VR abilities, personalities, using these different, um, they almost might consider script kitties because they have this particular code that they took from somebody, so they didn't create the code themselves, to use it to in order to hack into the Burning Chrome system. And it's just them trying, these two guys that are roommates and friends and partners in crime, trying to basically um, get into the system, get this money, and then leave. <laughs> and of course, things don't quite go down very well for either either the characters except for the girl that's in love. Uh, she ends up um, you know, getting a new look that allows her to go Hollywood, basically become famous, and leave the area, leave to, um, basically to Japan, basically, and, and they live, um, a better life, and these guys are basically stuck holding the bag, stuck back in the system that they are, they've, um, that they are part of, and what I found interesting was, one, the concept of, um, hacking to get into wealth, and you see that all the time now in the cryptocurrency space, and people, hacking exchanges to get money, uh, money laundering, um, burning chrome, which is described as someone who looks like a 14-year-old because she takes these hormonal drugs that make her look young. So this is a whole eternity factor. Um, people have a desire to look young and be internal looking, if you will, or trying to live forever um, in this particular short story. Uh, the concept of cyberspace in the Matrix, that's where they operate out of, where they create a you know a virtual persona to be able to hack into these different places. Um, jack in, if you will, is something that they do. So the early, early um, prototypes, if you will, of what you know Johnny Mnemonic, he started, and then with Burning Chrome, and then eventually will become um, the world that Necromancer takes place, um, starts here within this particular story. And what I found very fascinating was the concept of in this dystopia world where you have to basically have the skill set of understanding technology, working with technology, being able to code or jack in or something like that, or you're not going to really make it very far. Um, most of the people that we engage and interact with are, you know, the lower class. The corporations take, have taken over everything. There's not really much of a functioning government. Um, and what government there is, they do basically police work and they do a shoddy job at that. And so everything is just really like broken and secondhand and there's no really new thing going on, no, no hope, if you will. It's very depressing. It's very like, like everything's just smushed and smothered down. And because of things like the sprawl where everyone's smashed together, you have, you know, everyone being an asshole to each other because it's kind of like New York where you have all these massive amount of people and you don't have time to be polite or kind or care about the other person's existence. It's all about me, 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 self, self, self. 
And when you do finally do something that's, you know, kind of selfish, it turns out to be the wrong thing. That's something you sh you've known all your entire life. So it reinforces that kind of bias, if you will. And so I found that story very entertaining um, out of all of them um, that was in this short collection. Um, overall, it's a good breeze of a read, if you will, as far as books go. You can also find it as an audio book. Um, of the stories I really liked, you know, I like Johnny Mnemonic. Um, kind of like Greenback's Continuum. It was, it was kind of okay. Uh, Red Star, Winter Over It. I really like that one. And Burning Crow is a story I really like. Um, Hitterlands is okay, but it wasn't kind of my thing. Um, I do like Body Horror, but I think there's been some other kind of Body Horror kind of a, um, deals. Because that character eventually, um... Not to get too spoilish, but you can see some kind of body horror element into that story. Um, overall, I think the, the, the book, the collection of short stories was okay. Um, I can th You kind of can see, if you really like William Gibson as a, a novelist, you can see the progression of his writing and different themes and different concepts he's playing with with these short stories. And you can see how his evolution as a novel writer is a novelist, if you will, um, comes from. So as far as, you know, being a fan of his writing, um, I would highly recommend the book just so you can see how, you know, someone comes from being, you know, okay of a writer to a good writer to a great writer. You can kind of see the progression, if you will, with these short stories. Um, much like you, you know, we see with athletes or, art or um, actors or directors or things of the nature, you see their first movie and their latest movie, and then if you see the movies in between, you can see their progression as an artist and their different skill sets and the things that they do well. Um, the only thing I think that might benefit as far as, you know, reading this collection of short stories is to give you a familiarization of William Gibson, um, who obviously has... You know, Eric Melser has used his terms um, in interviews as well as within the game itself. Um, he says he's been heavily influenced by William Gibson, by cyberpunkdom, if you will. Um, would be good as a primer to understand that kind of world. I think Nex Necromancer might be better, but if you want to kind of dip your toes in real quick before reading something like Necromancer, um, this would be a good starting point. Uh, like I said, the belonging kind, there might be something there as far as clues go to the art tour. But this book uh, in general, considering that it was considered an object, might be handy just to read, just to see if there's any potential other insights to any other clues or um, obtaining of any of the keys that might come as we progress further into the game. So that's it, that's my review. I think the short story book Burning Chrome itself is okay. I think pretty much they only had really only really three good stories in it, but those are just my taste. That's just my opinion. Um, I have a link in the show notes to where you can get it if you want it. Um, but that's it for now. There's no really any updates on the game as a recording of Wednesday, um, June twelfth. Uh, the keys that are still out there are the Ubun key, the Earth key the art tour key, the clan key, which has the June 15th expression date, this latest one, the room key, and the business card key. So we have six keys out of 11 that are out there in the world. Uh, so this is Hiroshi Scheib. I hope you enjoy um, listening and watching this episode of Shitoshi's Treasure Hunters. Um, please like and subscribe, make some comments. Um, I also like to thank the people that have been subscribing um, to to the channel. I'm past 30 subscribers. I never thought I would even get close to that. So thank you for those who have subscribed and for those that have been sharing the show. And um, until next time, on with the hunt.